So please join me now in welcoming Alyssa with her keynote presentation, Diary from the Garden of Good Versus Evil, Hacking All the APIs. Thank you, Alyssa. Thanks, Saul. You know, I wouldn't exactly refer to myself as a treat. I think I'm more of like heartburn or <laughs> but so depending on who you ask. But good morning, Australia. Oh my goodness, I'm ending my day, you're starting your day. Uh, I feel sorry for you if I'm the way you're starting your day. Hopefully you've had your coffee, um, but this will definitely be this will definitely be a fun one. So yeah, thank you for introducing me, Saul. And I wanna take a moment to thank Deloitte um, as well and Saul uh, for um, organizing this and putting this together. So for those of you who have no idea who I am, uh, as uh, Saul uh, mentioned, uh, I am a recovering hacker. No, we don't all wear trench coats and rollerblades, um, but uh, I am uh, in the process of creating what's called, um, uh, basically I'm in the press of creating a screenplay for a new TV series uh, based on my life. I was arrested for hacking into a government network when I was 17. Uh, went to go work for the U.S. intelligence community in cyber warfare shortly thereafter. And as Saul mentioned, I've started and sold two previous cybersecurity startups. Uh, I am uh, recently uh, have been focused in hacking APIs and uh, have been referred to with many names like the Fuzz Queen or API, branded as an API hacker. In 2019, I hacked 30 banks, basically financial services and fintechs through their mobile apps and their APIs, um, sorry, I had a lot of water, so I'm like burping, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I hacked 30 M Health APIs in less than a week in 2020. Uh, in 2021, this year, I've been focused on publishing the vulnerabilities and hacking uh, federal and state law enforcement vehicles where I was taking remote control of vehicles through their APIs, believe it or not. And uh, now con hacking connected trains and super yachts. So I'm very intrigued by and always learning uh, how to hack APIs and um, love teaching it as well. So I'm very happy to be here today. And if you're laying in bed at night thinking, God, you know, that Alyssa Knight, she's amazing. What is the best way that I could support her? and other influencers. And that's definitely to subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on Twitter. Um, hit that bell icon on YouTube to be notified of my new uploads. I live stream and upload every week. So uh, definitely hit that subscribe button. Help me reach uh, that, um, that big number of 4,000 watch hours. So um, we all know I, at API Days what APIs are, um, but just a quick slide on this. You know, the average business runs over 620 APIs now. Uh, now they're in the thousands at many organizations. I uh, don't talk too publicly about this, but I am actually the CISO for bank. We have APIs. Everyone is pretty much running APIs. You know, the mobile apps that are running on your phone all the way to, like I said, um, the actual remote control of your vehicle. Everything is communicating with APIs, which have pretty much become the plumbing of our critical infrastructure today, IoT, Internet of Everything, uh, and everything in between. So uh, with this huge exodus away from monolithic applications to microservices, uh, API traffic now uh, represents more than 80% of the traffic flowing across CDNs like Akamai. So really interesting facts. Uh, so why APIs? Like I said, uh, they, they pretty much control everything. Uh, I've recently been publishing vulnerability research into hacking even healthcare APIs. So in phase one, I focused on hacking M Health APIs and then moving over to hacking what are called FHIR APIs, F H I R, fast healthcare interoperability and resources. And so what you're going to be seeing today in my presentation is a culmination of all of my API breaches everything that I've ever done regarding hacking APIs. And yep, for those of you in the audience who know me and have been following me, you know I back everything up with screenshots of evidence of my epic hacks. So don't just take my word for it. Pictures say a thousand words. I've got screenshots of, of evidence from the thousands of patient records I've breached through APIs, as well as hacking remote cars, hacking cars remotely. So. Uh, is including a, a, a case here on hacking a bank through its APIs where I was able to 
change the pin code of any ATM debit card number for any bank customer, as well as uh, transfer money. So uh, for those of you who are interested, you know, what is it exactly that Alyssa uses in her tool chest? What is her API hacking lab? Uh, when I'm targeting web APIs, I typically use a combination of Burp Suite uh, or Midim Proxy. So basically what I'll do is I'll download uh, what I love actually about Burp Suite is there's a little button within pro the proxy tab that allows you to actually launch Chromium, which is built into Burp Suite or comes with Burp Suite. And it allows you to very easily take the packets from browsing that web-based uh, uh, app, uh, communicating with that API, and throw those into your proxy tab in order to easily send those over to repeater and manipulate those requests or fuzz those, those um, different fields. And an alternative to that is Midim Proxy, uh, where you basically point your proxy on your machine to Midim Proxy that's running to capture, decrypt that SSL traffic and allow you to copy and paste those into an API client like Postman. And Postman, if you're in the audience, I absolutely adore you. I love you. Call me. I'd love to be an influencer for you. I absolutely love the Postman product. Uh, mobile APIs, mobile security framework um, is one of them. So I'll, I'll extract the APK off of my Android device, throw it in a MobSF, and do static and dynamic code analysis. I do that in every API hack that I'm targeting uh, APIs on. APK extractor, of course, is uh, in the Google Play Store. This is, again, targeting APIs uh, that are being communicated with, with mobile mobile apps. Um, I do use a combination of Postman and Midim Proxy or Burp Suite. I recently started moving over to Burp Suite. Uh, I love it. I love how it's just kind of like the Swiss Army knife. Sorry, I've got like something in my eye. Um, I've, I love how Burp Suite is just this multi-layered thing of all of these different tools all in one app. Like I said, I love Postman. It's a great API client. Um, but you do have to do a lot of manual uh, copying and pasting or typing uh, when you're using it because it's more of a traditional API client versus Burp Suite. Um, so I also fuzz APIs, and I want to talk about that in my presentation today. Kite Runner is one of the open source tools that you can use as well as Rustler uh, that allows you to fuzz APIs. And I would go as far to say is, you know, you you I don't really believe you've found every potential vulnerability unless you are fuzzing your APIs. Uh, I don't know why a lot of penetration testers don't do fuzzing. Maybe it's just a lack, of, a lack of knowledge in the area of fuzzing, not really understanding the tools or the interpreting the results. But if you don't know how to, to fuzz APIs, you should be. You need to go out there, you need to learn it because it's so powerful. Uh, content discovery, all that stuff is, is so important. And there's some amazing commercial tools in this as well. Um, my favorite, of course, being Detectify, um, who's a client. They're going to be coming out with... Uh, uh, an API fuzzer as well here soon. So he, this is my lab architecture when targeting and hacking APIs. Um, here you can see in my healthcare API breaches, I basically was running the mobile app. That map, mobile app would send get patient slash 1001 to the API. I would then get that patient's record. Uh, what I noticed was that when I intercepted the traffic um, and actually pointed my proxy on my phone at my machine, which was running Midim Proxy, I then copied and pasted those API requests into Postman and was able to send the same request to the API. Uh, and, and again, this is, is a completely different user. Uh, I had a token, um, but because of what's called a broken object level authorization vulnerability or BOLA vulnerability, I was able to retrieve that data from that API for the other patient record that did not belong to me. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that in my presentation today. Uh, this is my kill chain. Again, work smart or work hard. The work hard approach is combining Postman and Midim Proxy. Again, I don't. I want to make this clear. I love Postman. It's a great client. Um, but combining that and then running Midim Proxy in the background, it can just all kind of be like just hodgepodge of different tools. Whereas with Burp Suite, you, you just have that one tool. You've got the proxy tab. You've got the repeater tab and you've got um, everything you need all in one place. Uh, and the neat thing about Burp Suite is there is a community edition, which is free. Uh, I do use the, the paid for version. Uh, it's not that much different from the community edition. Uh, basically the professional version, uh, I think has some additional scanners and stuff that I've never used. Um, so there really was no point to me buying it. I just wanted to support uh, Port Swigger. Um, so for web proxies, my steps were basically um, Burp Suite, 
then go into proxy, load browser, click every option in the app, send packets to repeater, modify the values, and then fuzz the APIs. So I can't stress this enough. You know, when I'm testing an API, so if you're wondering, okay, what is Alyssa Knight's kill chain? What does she follow step by step when she's hacking APIs? What I do is I basically just go from starting from step one, I log into the, the app, or, or whether it's the web app or the mobile app, and I just start clicking all the buttons. I click on all the options and I record all the packets. And then I put all of those API requests into a spreadsheet or I flag them in Burp Suite and highlight them, whatever. But I, I basically try every single possible option with the app. Everything that the developers allowed me to do, especially if there's no documentation with the API, I'll, I'll check every option with the app and see what's possible or not possible. Once I, I grab those packets, I then manipulate them and then forward them onto the API outside of the mobile app. So I'll use Burp Suite or again, Postman. With mobile APIs, I'll extract the app out using APK Extractor, ironically enough, downloadable from the Google Play Store. I'll reverse engineer the app in MobSF, and I will actually drop to the shell. Now, MobSF is a, a free tool. You can download it from GitHub. If you haven't checked it out, it's amazing. Go check it out. Um, and it will allow you to do static code analysis, dynamic code analysis, and it's got a really pretty web-based GUI. It's, it, I gotta admit, it's very sexy. It's very GUIified. Uh, you just drag and drop the APK file into MobSF and it takes it from there. It reverse engineers it, it brings it all the way back to the source, and you can then go in there and search the source code for API keys and tokens, secrets, credentials. I found usernames and passwords hard-coded. You find all kinds of lovely jewels, crown jewels inside that that like the developer didn't expect these. So these are real screenshots of all of the API keys and tokens, some for third-party payment processors, some for P2P stuff, like just API keys and tokens that are not supposed to be hard-coded into the app without some, court of additional, some sort of additional security layer. Uh, it's just a bad thing to, to, to do, be doing. So shame on you developers, stop doing that, stop doing it, um, stop doing it. <laughs> Um, it's really easy to get to. Okay, are you guys ready? And girls, are you guys and girls ready for hacking federal and state law enforcement vehicles? Uh, I was um, fortunate enough to have my uh, wife and uh, partner in the uh, company, Melissa, join me in this, uh, this research. Uh, broken object level authorization, um, just for those of you who are not um, familiar with what BOLA is, it, I, I like to use the analogy of a coat check. So let's say, we'll pick on Sal. Let's, let's say Sal and I go to a cocktail party. We're both standing in line for the coat check and he gives his coat to the coat check person and it's a very expensive Burberry coat. And I say, you know what? I'm going to steal Sal's coat. I want that Burberry coat. So the woman hands the ticket to Sal and I see that that ticket has the number 18 on it. So what I do is I take uh, my coat, my cheap coat, I turn it in, I get the number 17. I go off into the party and I change that seven with a Sharpie to an eight. I go back to the coat check and now I've got the number 18 and I go home with Saul's coat. That's basically a great example of a bowl of vulnerability. It's, it's, you're authenticated. So you have a token, you're, you're allowed to be there. You're allowed to be talking to the API, but because of the bowl of vulnerability, I'm requesting data that does not belong to me. And uh, an example of that is in the case of healthcare, requesting a patient record that didn't belong to me, or in the case of law enforcement vehicles, remotely controlling a car. So locking and unlocking the doors or even stopping and starting an engine. So these are actual real screenshots, redacted, but actual screenshots of me taking remote control of law enforcement vehicles. Um, the interesting thing here, and um, obviously many of you probably already know what HTTP 200 means. It means successful. It's a success code for HTTP. And here, the, one of the vulnerabilities that I found with the API was that I could actually request to add the law enforcement vehicle to my virtual garage in the mobile app. And then once I make that request, because of a vulnerability, I was able to approve my own request. They weren't doing any correlation between the JOT token, the logged in username, which was actually stored in the JOT token, the URI, which contained the VIN, 
and uh, the other data. So they weren't correlating any of that. And so you could actually request a remotely controlled vehicle and then you could go in there and then approve your own request. So a huge logic flaw there. Um, so I could, you know, let's say I wanted to remotely control Saul's car. We'll keep on picking on Saul. Um, and uh, I want to remotely control his vehicle, play with him and scare him and start and stop his engine, lock and unlock his doors. Um, I'll just send a request to control the car remotely and then approve it for him and he'd be none the wiser. Um, VIN's not assigned to a specific user ID or able to request geolocation information on the vehicle. So this was really interesting. So even though a VIN wasn't assigned to me in the virtual garage, I could actually send API requests requesting all the details where that car is containing uh, contained in the database. So where that car's been, all that other stuff. This is of course a life and safety issue for law enforcement officers, which isn't good. Um, so this w was basically me with a screenshot of Minim Proxy, where you could see uh, all of the information um, where I was actually intercepting that traffic. And because of uh, a lack of certificate pinning, I could actually decrypt that traffic. Now, this is a prevalent issue. It's a systemic issue across mobile apps where I'm seeing that organizations are not implementing pinning. It's simple and easy to do, it's fast. Now, there are developers who say, look, you know, it doesn't offer much security and there's a huge potential to brick the app. Um, I, of course, don't agree with this, but, you know, teach her own, but uh, it makes something like this possible. So, you know, look into pinning your apps. There's great security solutions like, for example, Approve that makes pinning uh, administratively easy. And so you can look at solutions uh, like a proof who sponsored the healthcare hacking research of APIs um, that will give you that capability. So, you know, pin your apps. I, it offers, it basically makes it a lot harder for hackers uh, like myself uh, to cause pr all these problems. Um, there were a lot of hard coded tokens and hard coded keys in the mobile apps. Um, and for this one, especially for app uh, that is capable of remotely controlling a law enforcement vehicle. Um, there was a lot of things in there, like I'm sure you're all of you know uh, or recognize some of the names in there, like Stripe, um, you know, so Sendbird, uh, Firebird, all a lot of hard coded API keys and tokens that were available to me. These are more screenshots. Um, this was really interesting. Uh, I here's a dump of everything regarding that particular law enforcement vehicle. As long as you knew the VIN, you could you could perform these attacks. Uh, we all know getting the VIN for a car, at least I'm sure even in Australia, um, it's easy to actually find out the VIN of a vehicle by just looking through the windshield uh, and it's right there on the dash, just snap a picture of it in the parking lot and then off you go. Or just take at least one VIN and then increment all the VINs by one number by plus one and you'll notice that the automakers actually don't randomly generate the VINs. They actually will increase the every car in the fleet by one number. So I was able to um, go after a whole fleet of law enforcement vehicles just by incrementing the VIN by one. Uh, for those of you who have not seen my YouTube channel, go check me out on YouTube. There are videos on my YouTube channel of me um, actually performing these attacks. You can see the car being turned on, the engine turning off, and the cars unlocking and locking. So here, I don't know if you can see this, but the series of the vehicle says sedan police. Again, being able to remotely identify whether a vehicle is a law enforcement vehicle or not is, is a real problem. Uh, here's a screenshot of me successfully locking the doors of a law enforcement vehicle that was in another state. Again, as all of you know, if the API is facing the internet and it's accessible online and I can reach it, I can do these attacks from any country. I can do it from space if I had an internet connection from the moon. So um, as long as you know the VIN, you have the ability to remotely control these vehicles through the APIs. Uh, this is me sending a request to unlock the doors. Um, here you can see a screenshot where it says HB200 successful. And of course, there's a video on my YouTube channel of you seeing the doors unlock when this attack was being performed. I did the courtesy of giving all of you the API request for the API for remotely controlling the vehicle. So uh, this is just a spreadsheet I created. Now, what, what, what is it that you guys notice, that you guys and girls notice about the spreadsheet regarding all of these uh, API requests? 
Is there anything that that you can uh, notice that's the, that kind of sticks out to you? Raise your hand. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got you. If you raised your hand, uh, I got you. I can't see you. Okay. Uh, any uh, so basically, if you look at the token column, you'll notice that a majority of the attacks requires the attacker's token. It doesn't require the victims. So only one particular API request. Um, can take, you can use any token. Um, and then only one particular API request requires the victim's token from a minimum attack or what I like to call a woman in the middle attack. But everything else is either an, any token or the attacker's token. And so um, I've put all of these into a spreadsheet and the associated payloads and the report for this is going to be dropping soon. All right. So uh, I'm going to check back in my web browser, make sure I'm not over time. Okay. So uh, for findings for healthcare, uh, as many of you may know, I've been focused on hacking healthcare this year uh, and last year, and I'm going to be dropping the results for me hacking fire APIs. And that's actually not a U.S. initiative. It's a global initiative. It's, it was created by HL7 International, so Health Level 7 International, and it's a standard for making patient data available through APIs with any healthcare provider and payer. Now, the, again, this is not a U.S. initiative, it's global. So organizations around the world are adopting FHIR as the standard to make patient data available to patients that request it. And as usual, we innovate before we secure. And I am I went on this vulnerability campaign just hunting for vulnerabilities in, in these FHIR APIs. So here you can see screenshots of these patient records. Uh, here, again, my favorite API client, Postman where you can see I'm sending this request uh, for the, in this case, it was hospital admission records and they actually weren't automatically generating, uh, randomly generating a, a patient ID when they admitted a patient. So I could just um, cycle through every patient from one to 10,000 and grab all of this patient data. And so here you can see all of the data that's pulled from patient records from this API. This is why patient records are worth so much on the dark web. They're worth a thousand times more on the dark web marketplaces than a credit card. And I believe it's because of the fact that you get so much data on an individual if you have their PHI or protected health information. If you think about it, let's say, for example, we'll pick on Saul again. Let's say I wanted to kill Saul and I wanted to make it look like an accident. All I would have to do is hack any number of APIs in the world that might have his, his patient records or these aggregators and look for his patient record and then find out what Saul is, is uh, allergic to. And then let's say I find out that Saul is allergic to bee stings uh, and I wanted to, for some reason, kill Saul. I could just let a bunch of bees go in his house and he's gone and no one would know that uh, what had happened. So... Again, um, really dangerous to get your hands on someone's patient records. You know, you find out they're diabetic or whatever. Um, this, is, this is all very sensitive data. Um, in this uh, uh, screenshot, you'll see that I've stolen pathology reports. And here within Postman, what I really loved about Postman was it has this capability to save the response. And I was actually able to save this response to the PDF file. So here you can see I'm pulling a patient record for a pathology report. So I could actually pull PDF files from this API. And because they weren't randomly generating the file name, it was started at number one. Here it's 8,422,946. So there were 8 million, at least 8 million uh, PDF files on this on this server that I was able to pull. And so I, I pulled this record and then I exported it to my drive. And here you can see the full PDF file of that particular pathology report. Um, you could I could pull x-rays. I was I was seeing images of people's x-rays. So all again, all very important stuff. Uh, this was really interesting. One of the mobile health apps that I was testing actually allowed me, um, what I noticed was that when I, I logged into the API, it actually allowed me to unlock that session uh, with my face. So for uh, those of you who have an iPhone, you, you, you'll know that uh, you'll recognize the concept of face ID. So I noticed that if I was logged in with the mobile app, the session would get locked and I could actually unlock it with my face and then that session would get unlocked. Well, I came back like days later and noticed that when I unlocked that session again, 
it's the app actually sent the same exact secret and i don't know if you can see that screenshot but it's the the last few letters and numbers were the same every single time that i unlocked that session and i was able to actually take over so it's called session takeover i was able to just copy and paste this secret into postman uh, or burp suite and resend it days and weeks later and it just unlocked those previous sessions so uh again another dangerous flaw here where the developer was hard coding the secret and it was being used every time oh look at that turtle you're probably asking yourselves Alyssa, why did you use a turtle for this slide i don't know i thought it was cute i put a turtle there it was great I brighten up your morning diary from the garden of good versus evil hacking apis hacking banks all right so this is a screenshot <laughs> of me hacking an incredibly large bank and so here you can actually see the member id that i was logged in as the, the card number for the atm debit card and then a unique identifier um and all of the fields that I recreated into Postman and then went in there and started changing the pin code of any bank customer and surprise, I disabled cookies and it still allowed me to do it. So I was able to change pin codes and I was able to move money around without authenticating. So a lot of fun. There's an awesome video on my YouTube channel of the entire thing with and without cookies. I think it's episode number nine of night TV. So go check it out. It's even got some great background music for you guys to rock out to and girls. Thank you for your time. That is it. I actually didn't run over today, so I'm really proud of myself. So, um, Saul, if you're still there, we can, uh, give the microphone back to you and uh, answer any questions that people might have. Hey, Alyssa, thanks for that. I feel very hacked. I mean, you... <laughs> I was about to say, I feel bad for picking on you, but I can think of the other <laughs> name. <laughs> so, wow. I mean, what can I say? These are the sorts of things that we as API developers really need to know and understand. Yeah. And um, I guess, I, and I'm surprised that people are still doing sequential IDs. Yeah, you would think, I mean, you know, yes. and I, I have an enormous amount of respect for developers. I, I don't want, I know that the relationship between security engineers, like hackers and developers is very adversarial, no pun intended, but you know, I, I do, I have an immense amount of respect for developers. Cause I couldn't, I like to be able to go in there and write whatever you want for whatever need is amazing. I have so much respect for developers, but you know, I feel like we're we're instrumental and we have value in being able to sit down with developers and say, hey, look, you know, and the, this is what happens if you do these things like hard coding things or not um, not automatically or randomly generating file names or user IDs when you just go in there and you sequentially increment it by a given number. Uh, this is what happens. And it's able to, you're able to actually guess file names and cycle through them. Yeah, that's ridiculous. So, I mean, I always use as a as a as a high level guide the OWASP top top ten, and it sounds like people don't even get through the top three, right? Yeah, that's a good <laughs> point. That's a good point, Saul. So, yeah, and you know, interesting enough, I'm sure many of you have seen this, but um, OWASP actually published the OWASP API security top ten. Absolutely, so, yeah. Yeah, so there's the OWASP top ten, and then there's the OWASP API security top ten. And so number one on that list, much to your point, Saul, number one on that risk list is BOLA. And it is the most common vulnerability that I find in APIs. So developers in the audience, for those of you wanting to write more secure code, or those of you who want to get into API hacking, um, you need to remember that you need to authenticate the request and you need to authorize the request. It's not just about authentication. It's also about authorization and using scopes and some of those other important security controls. Yeah, absolutely. Putting that authorization logic in is really important. Yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, beyond the OWASP API top 10, is there anything else we need to know? And I love, so you're, um, you've got a YouTube channel, channel called Night TV. Yep. Uh, this is, um, uh, next time I have a customer who says, oh, why do I need all of this expensive extra security stuff? 
I can point them to that. And, there you uh, go. Yeah, I'm actually, and and I don't know if I if I mentioned this in my bio, but I'm actually in the process of writing a new book on hacking APIs. So I published a book on hacking connected cars. Now um, I'm in the process of publishing a new book on hacking APIs. So that'll be out early next year. Um, you can find my previous book on Amazon if for those of you who are interested. And um, uh, the next book will be focused on hacking APIs. Right. Excellent. And what do you think? I mean, fire you've mentioned is a, is a global standard that we, we're adopting here in Australia as well. Is there oh. anything sp specific to fire that we need to be aware of, or is it is it the same techniques? You know, these OS top ten APIs um, are they going to be good enough for us to um, to to um, protect our fire APIs? Yeah, so um, one of the things that, and I, I don't want to go into too much detail as a spoiler for what's coming because um, I'm going to okay. actually be releasing the report very soon here in a few weeks. But um, one thing I will say is that the vulnerabilities that I've found are actually not in the EMR or, or electronic medical records slash EHR <coughs> electronic health record systems that many of you are probably familiar with. There's just a handful uh, in the world, um, many of them, uh, several of them much larger than the others. But the vulnerabilities I was finding were not actually in those EMRs. What I was finding were vulnerabilities in the lower level areas that actually pu pull data from those EMRs. So a lot of these, for example, data, what are called data aggregators in the healthcare space where they're aggregating health records, um, you know, a lot of those aggregators and um, third parties who you hire to come in and build the fire infrastructure for you and build those apps and, and those third party plugins and ecosystems are actually where the vulnerabilities I'm finding are. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like with WordPress, right? So many of you recall how many black eyes that WordPress got as a CMS for vulnerabilities for many years. And then eventually WordPress kind of, you know, caught up and figured themselves out. And, and it's definitely a lot more secure today than it was before. But now it's not the vulnerabilities in WordPress that you're finding, it's vulnerabilities in the plugins that you're installing into WordPress. So, you know, that's where a lot of the vulnerabilities in WordPress are today. And so it's really the same thing in healthcare where the EHRs, EMRs are, are not the culprit here. It's the third-party developers that are coming in and developing for fire and pulling these medical records. And I will tell you, you know, you heard it from me, a hacker, we're not, we're going to go with the path of least resistance. We're not going to go with the hardest Fort Knox, you know, area where we're going to try and steal those medical records. We're going to steal them for the path of least resistance from the databases and the systems outside of the EMR and outside of that system where they're being aggregated to. And we're going to go after that if that's where all the vulnerabilities are. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the lesson there is you're only, you, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And when, exactly, we, build these, exactly. when we build these communities like the, the, open banking community, I think is another right. important one, that there's going to be smaller um, organisations in there that we really have to help them um, get on top of the security issues. You know, maybe all, yeah, and we're all in this together, Salt. You know, I mean, and I don't, yeah. I really, I really am trying to change that narrative. It really shouldn't be developers, us against them and us against IT or us against network engineering or us against developers. We're all in this together. You can just, you know, to play drives from the pandemic, we're all in this together. You know, we're all, we're all fighting a common enemy, right? It's not about kind of calling you developers out and saying, Hey, write better code. You guys suck. That's not what this is about. It's we're like, we're helping you. You're helping us. The, the code, the application is the the ingress point that hackers are using that 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 uh, adversaries are using and one of the things that you need to remember is that to me the definition of hacking is just sending stimulus to an application that the developer didn't expect to receive that's all hacking is it's not any more fairy dust or magic than that it's 
sending stimulus that you as the developer did not expect to, for, to receive that was not part of the mobile app or not part of the web app. I just went into my API client like Postman and I sent it to the API and you just didn't expect to receive it and you got it anyway. What is your response for at the code level to that request? to that stimulus, what is your response? Is it, you know, um, executing shell code that I've inserted in a memory? Or is it pulling records from the database when those records don't belong to me? What is your response to that stimulus? That's what hacking is to me. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned fuzzing. That that seems to be a fairly uh, popular thing these days. That yeah. how, how important is that to you? That that's... Um... I... You know, I, I that's a great question, Saul. And, you know, I, I think it depends on who you ask because I know a lot of penetration testers, a lot of ethical hackers that do not do fuzzing. Um, and I, I don't know if it's just because they're kind of scared of the idea of it because they just don't really understand it or can interpret the results or know about the tools. But, um, you know, there's some great tools out there now. Like I said, uh, uh, there's some great tools coming from companies like Detectify. And, you know, I think it's important. I think that a pen, I'll go as far to say that a penetration test, for those of you who are in the audience who are pen testers, I would go as far to say that your pen test is not complete until you fuzzed. Go fuzz yourself. It's important. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. A couple of comments in the uh, chat stream around, uh, you know, uh, API devs going and revisiting their code or having, uh, marketplace editions audited is there an important area for uh code review i guess yeah yeah so um thank you for the question uh you know and it, and it brings up a good point that i forgot to mention i'm a big believer in shift left security but shield right and so you know you're gonna find you know that there's a wrong way to secure apis i believe as a as as an adversary is somebody that um, you know, breaches APIs as part of her job um, to write content and create content is that there's wrong ways to secure APIs and there's right ways. I don't believe that the right way to secure an API is with a web application firewall because so many of the APIs that I've breached have been secured behind WAFs. You should be using, looking at API threat management solutions, you know, like um, just to name a few, no name security, traceable, approve, um, you know, human who's focusing on the bot problem and synthetic traffic. You know, I really don't believe that you should be using the wrong tool for the job, which I believe is WAFs. As far as in the code, I believe that we should be inserting security into the SDLC or the software development lifecycle as the code is being written. So there's tools out there that will actually, um, like 42 Crunch, for example, that will actually insert itself during development time and yell at the developer, yell at the programmer when they're writing insecure code. All the way to shield right, where, where they'll either sit in line or sit passively. Um, for those of you who have not seen it yet, last week I published a video on the state of the API security market and um, it's called the 2022 API Security Buyer's Guide. So for those of you who are starting an API security project, check out that video. I talk about some great solutions that are out there that you can use, um, but you need to determine, are you looking for something in line? Are you looking for something passive? And for you developers, are do you want something that actually plugs into your application development interface? Um, you know, are you looking for something kind of review your code as you're writing it? Those are all things that you need to co complete as par part of part of your uh, your functional requirements document or what's called an FRD before you go out there and shop for a solution. Excellent. Okay. Um, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, thank some you. of your experience with us, Alyssa. It's really. Um, I think woken everybody up to uh, the challenges that we yeah. have to face and, and keeps us honest. Uh, yeah, well, not so much honest, but keeps us alert, right? Yeah. We should be alert, but not alarmed, as they say. Um, and uh, yeah, remember, do your OS top 10, watch night TV, and uh, mm -hmm. that'll make you a much better secure API developer. <laughs> That's true. Thank you so much, Sal. And I want to thank Deloitte. I want to thank you. And I want to thank the API Days team. I also, um, please, again, um, the best way you can support me and my content is subscribe to my YouTube channel, like my videos, comment, watch the videos. Um, and I want to thank all of you for attending today. And enjoy API Days Australia. 
Okay. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, Sal.